My guest today is Andrew Brust. Andrew, how are you? I'm well. How are you? Uh, I'm doing great. Tell me, what do you do? So I, I wear many hats. Yeah. Um, once upon a time, I was a developer, um, and I've always, always, always been interested in databases, database technology, and BI and analytics. Mm -hmm. Um, I pivoted about, I don't know, 12 years ago from being in the world of consulting to um, being a journalist and an analyst kind of uh, following the industry. Hmm. My niche within that is I brought, you know, my, my technology interest with me. So I, I'm still hands-on with a lot of the tools to the point where I can give talks about them at conferences like the one you and I find ourselves at. At right Sum here in yeah. Stockholm. Yeah, yeah. Um, most uh, analysts don't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I am. I'm in that weird space between being technical and being a news junkie about the industry and following the different players and understanding, I don't know, the technology and the strategy and how those two map together. That's kind of cool. You get to talk to a lot of people with that, 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 uh, that know, that have deep knowledge on a subject and you get to learn about from them, which is exactly what I am doing right here, right now. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, and when sort of the the big data world started, most of the companies that are now also big were startups, and most of the CEOs were, you know, the founding CEOs, and they were pretty technical. Mm -hmm. So they were happy to talk to a journalist that kind of knew what a join was. I mean, <laughs> the bar was pretty low. I don't have to be a rock star developer to make them feel happy. So so that worked. It was kind of dumb luck, but it worked. Awesome. Uh, and I have heard that you are a data guy. What's, what's, what's exciting? What should we talk about that's exciting in the data world? Well, I'm, again, with that, with that space in the middle of the tech and the, and the strategy, I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in talking about how Microsoft and its data technology and its technology all up mm -hmm. is doing um, com, you know, relative to its competitors oh, okay. in the industry. I'm a Microsoft uh, MVP for 20 years. Oh, wow and a Microsoft RD for 22, a regional director. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always been rooting for Microsoft. And when yeah, I went- I appreciate that. <laughs> when I went into the big data world, Microsoft wasn't there yet. So okay. I was sort of out in the desert and looking at all these other companies and mm -hmm. then Microsoft came in. So, you know, my sweet spot is the intersection between data and Microsoft. Okay, it took yeah. us a while to get there. What's, uh, uh, what, what, what caused, you say Microsoft wasn't there before, but they are now. What what was what changed? Well, um, they, they were always in. Well, who, define always, but for a long time they were in the data world. But the big data world was based on open source technology, okay. and most of that based on um, stuff running on Linux and written in Java, like all the Hadoop stuff. It, correct. Um, and Microsoft actually got into the big data world by partnering with a company that no longer exists, it was acquired, called um, Hortonworks, mm. to port Hadoop to Windows. That's actually how Microsoft got started with okay. it. Mm. They then ported their own distribution of Hadoop back to Linux, mm. just to show you how Microsoft has changed. Very much so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I mean, we know Microsoft has become much more Linux friendly, especially with its move to the cloud. It's become much more open source friendly Absolutely. in many contexts, and so the the big data and what we might now call the data lake world became much, it became much more Microsoft friendly and Microsoft became much more friendly to it. Um, mm -hmm. But if you go all the way back to like 2010, it wasn't quite so. I see. Uh, now there's other, uh, so I, I, a lot of this has to do with the cloud. I mean, the, the mm -hmm. cloud has empowered big data, right? It, you Correct. don't have to have a supercomputer in your basement anymore. Right. So uh, the, uh, you can just rent huge amounts of compute power, huge amounts of storage. Right, um, right. And, and maybe you don't need a supercomputer, but you at least kind of need a rack's worth of yeah, commodity there were, there servers. Yeah, there were barriers to entry. You know, big companies, universities, think tanks, mm -hmm. they could do it. But you and I just, we couldn't buy racks of computers. That was just, it was cost prohibitive to own and maintain that. But also people like you and me with our, you know, our windows and sort of maybe visual studio okay. orientation were at a further disadvantage because we weren't going to be setting up a bunch of Linux servers in our, in uh -huh. our, in our basement. So, um, but, so the cloud, uh, uh, the cloud abstracts that away too. Good point. 
<laughs> which has helped. It helped me specifically. Yeah. Oh, our, our other cloud providers have been doing the same thing, right? Their big data is available. Amazon, Google, Correct. those are the hyperscale <laughs> vendors. What are they doing? So I guess, in a way, all the big data stuff and Hadoop, Hadoop's not really the thing anymore. Now it's Spark. Okay. But before Spark, there was Hadoop. Before there was Hadoop, there was Google's own proprietary MapReduce. They, they basically published uh, papers on MapReduce and the Google file system, which was a distributed file system where you could put lots of really plain old disks that were attached to all the servers in the cluster hmm. and kind of federate them to look like one big storage volume. Okay. So Google published their papers on MapReduce and GFS. GFS is the file Google, system. The Google file system. Well, and then What is MapReduce? MapReduce is a one algorithm for dealing with really large amounts of data. It's perhaps less important now that people understand it, but the gist of it is you start with a big mess of data. You then um, kind of sort through it and decode it down to um, a bunch of key and value pairs. That's, okay. that's the map step. Mm -hmm. And then the reduce step is to take all the values for all the given key, for any given key, and somehow reduce them down, aggregate them mm -hmm. to a single value. Okay, and this is how you deal with big data, with massive yeah. amounts of data. It, it's, it's not unlike a group by in SQL, okay. actually. Okay. Um, but MapReduce sounds more impressive, I guess. But, <laughs> but anyway, Google published those papers, and then a team at Yahoo said, we're going to try and build an open source implementation of this. And that became Hadoop. Oh, I see. And that team became Hortonworks, the company that I mentioned before, that hmm. partnered with Microsoft. Ah, so so the, the tools in Microsoft they still exist, they're still evolving, but Hortonworks went by the side of the road. Well, there were two big competitors in this world: Hortonworks and Cloudera, okay. and, and they merged. And oh, Cloudera is the surviving entity. Got it. Okay. But most of Hortonworks' technology was the surviving tech, so. Um, it's hard to say one one out. Um, it really was a merger, hmm. but in, in terms of the naming, it, it went with Cloudera. Got it. Yep, yep. And they're a client of mine, as a matter of fact. I didn't know that. Yep, yep. So, yeah. So, so Google kind of helped us uh, originate all this, but um, there have been all sorts of implementers. Um, Microsoft first entered the arena with um, with its HD Insight service mm -hmm. running in the cloud, although there was an on-premises version too, okay. short-lived, but it existed. Um, and then Amazon had their own, it's called Elastic MapReduce, but their, I would say their claim to fame was this thing called Redshift, which was uh, arguably the first cloud-based data warehouse. And data warehouse technology goes back decades. Sure. But um, essentially, Amazon existed in one smaller competitor in that field, in the on-premises world, and, and sort of made it cloud-ready, and it became Redshift. Um, Google has something called BigQuery, which has become very, very popular as well. And then Microsoft has gone through multiple iterations of things. Its initial data warehouse product that was on-premises was um, uh, 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 SQL Server uh, Data Warehouse, and um, and then that kind of morphed into the analytics platform system, then into Azure SQL Data Warehouse, and ultimately it landed as Synapse Analytics and Microsoft Fabric, as okay. things are today. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh, and that that is a very competitive. Um, Offering and I was on the early adopter program for Fabric and I've been, I've been around the Microsoft Analytics stack for a long time, late 90s, really since its inception. I was on Microsoft's Partner Advisory pre, pre, Council. Pre Azure. Definitely pre Azure. Um, it was the first appearance of OLAP inside of SQL Server when I started okay. to get involved. Uh, the, the analysis services, I think it was called. The, except for the first year, it was called OLAP services. Got it. I yeah. Know that. Yep. It came from an acquisition of a company called Panorama in Israel, <laughs> um, and you know some of the people that came from Panorama, like Amir Nets, are still with Microsoft now. They're at the technical fellow level, and guess what? They're 
you know, Amir is kind of the, the mastermind behind, uh, behind Fabric. So there is, the lineage oh, is like significant. <laughs> oh, he, he, he's a good guy. Uh, what's going on today? What's, is there something exciting happening in this space right now? Or is, has everything already been invented? <laughs> it's, a, it's interesting you ask the question that way. Certainly not, it's not the case that everything's been invented, but I would say one of the problems in the industry is that so much has been invented that it's led to this like ridiculous complexity and fragmentation. Um, in many cases, people who are doing stuff with um, data and analytics have had to cobble together different solutions from different companies. Okay. Even if you stick with one company, up until recently, this includes has included Microsoft, you had to cobble together a number of different services, right? Mm -hmm. So okay. maybe you had to cobble together Azure SQL Data Warehouse and um, Azure Data Factory and Azure Event Hubs and, um, and just the different storage offerings, be it Blob Storage or Azure Data Lake Storage. It's been the customer's problem to integrate all the pieces. Right. The reason I'm so happy about Fabric is because it defragments the Microsoft stack into a, a, an actual unified platform. Mm. And there's, uh, there's a lot of um, cynicism out there that people have looked at Fabric and thought, well, all it is is a rebranding and a repackaging of all the services we had before. And that's not the case at all. It is, yeah. it is a strong integration. And it's an integration, not just technologically, but also economically, because instead of having to manage all these different pools of compute and to pay for them separately in each of these um, silos, it's uh, software as a service. You're not provisioning stuff yourself. Um, I mean, you can, you can get granular if you want to and specify the way um, clusters will be uh, configured and so forth if you want to, but you don't have to. And um, you kind of pay for it as one pool of compute. I see. Um, and that's a big deal. So, so it's not the case that everything's already been invented, but I think where the innovation's happening now is to take existing technologies and, and bring them together and make them easier to, to use and take advantage of. Oh, excellent. That, that then lowers the barrier entry, not just in terms of cost, but in terms of education and uh, just getting up to speed and up and running. I think so. I mean, if something's all in one platform and you learn one part of it, then the next part is adjacent to it and not completely different with a different UI, a different API, and a different skill set. Sure, yeah. And I think that's always been Microsoft's play, going back to like when I was a Visual Basic developer, you know, and then the web came along, and then there was active server pages, which you could continue to program in. I remember them well. In, in Visual it, Basic I, I and JavaScript. I taught a and, class on ASP. Yeah. And using Visual Interdev. There you go. <laughs> um, so uh, said the guys with their gray hair. <laughs> but, but the point was Microsoft's always been good at saying, let's get a technology out in the market. Let's get a big ecosystem mm -hmm. and a ton of momentum around it. And then let's bring stuff to that community instead of making them have to start from scratch to pick up a new skill set. Let's make it, let's bridge it. Excellent. And is the whole industry doing this? Is, uh, no. No. Uh, Microsoft is the, <laughs> the only ones doing it? No, I wouldn't say that actually, um, and I already, you know, full disclosure that Cloudera is a client, but the Cloudera data platform is a data platform okay. and has been um, for a few, a few years uh, after that merger of Cloudera and, and Hortonworks. Is that still what uh, Microsoft's tools are built on top of, their big data tools? Um, you said earlier that it started with uh, Hortonworks, which became part of Cloudera. Yeah, no, I mean, Fabric really isn't about Hadoop at all. Okay. It is, it is um, parts of it are largely based on Apache Spark, Got it. which Databricks is actually the founders of Databricks are the people who created Apache Spark. Okay. Um, but uh, so the data engineering and uh, data science parts are very Spark based, but other things are very SQL server based. Um, mm -hmm. And other things, like I said, you know, have their, um, their genesis in uh, Azure services. There's also something that exists on Azure as Azure Data Explorer and exists in Fabric as KQL databases. The mm -hmm. K coming from Custo, which was its K-U-S-T-O, mm -hmm. which was its code name. And that is a very cool time series database for doing analytics 
on huge amounts of time series data. And very interestingly, a lot of people on that team were once on the analysis services team. Oh, so okay. you see all roads lead back to <laughs> SQL Server analysis <laughs> services. Um, yeah, <laughs> Cousteau, I learned this recently, is a misspelling, a deliberate misspelling of Jacques Cousteau. I always thought, it, when I heard the name, I said, as in Jacques, and people said, no, it's no, no, K-U-S-T-O. I've, talk, I've talked to the product team. I've had them on this show, and it's because uh, uh -huh. you're diving deep into deep into big uh, data. I see. Okay. And, of course, it's misspelled, so you can use search engines to find it and mm -hmm. not get Jacques's <laughs> resume. So. Well, it's query language is KQL for the KQL. Cousteau query language, yes. so it's not CQL. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, and so my question was, is it, um, are the other vendors do, going on the same path and trying to integrate their tools uh, to make them easier to use? Right. Uh, I don't, I, I don't I see much of that. You don't see that. Okay. So they are, they are innovating in terms of making their tools better and more scalable and more powerful, but this, this integration piece is what's, I think, where you're saying that Microsoft is leading. Yeah. I'll, I'll caveat that a little bit. Like, if you look at Google and BigQuery, they're working to add more and more capabilities to BigQuery oh, I see. to almost make that a platform in itself. And a, a arch competitor with kind of everybody is um, Snowflake, okay. and they're taking that approach too, like uh, making their data warehouse not a data warehouse, but a data platform. At least the marketing would have you believe that. But I don't really think that's equivalent. I don't think it's the same as taking, you know, as many as seven or eight specialized platforms and bringing them together and putting an abstraction layer over all of them to democratize them and actually make them work together without having to think about it. Yeah. I do also like the idea of uh, <clears throat> rather than uh, building the capabilities into uh, an existing tool, taking tools that people are already using mm -hmm. and just making them work together. That, that appeals to the open source world. I, I mean, I think so. A lot of people in the data world in the early days of big data, again, going back to like 2010, 2011, 2012, were kind of enamored of inventing and inventing and further inventing new stuff. Sure. And I feel like that was the scatter part, and now we're on the gather part. <laughs> <laughs> we need both. Uh, that's, a, that's a Fox Pro term, scatter <laughs> and gather. <laughs> Um, I was a Fox Pro developer now I'm showing once my upon a time. Remember yeah. Scatter and Gather? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, this, is cool. this is a really good uh, perspective on the history of where this came from. and where. Uh, but uh, what, So what's, let's finish off with what's next, do you think? What's going to be the next innovation in big data? Well, I mean, it's kind of a low-hanging piece of fruit to say AI is disrupting everything here. Okay. Um, but it is. Yeah. But, you know, and I was just having a discussion with a few other people. We're going to have a panel discussion later about AI and how it's sort of changing technology practices and so on. Hmm. Um, as much as AI comes from data, I don't see the data world um, embracing AI or quite knowing what to do with it yet for hmm. its mainline work. Okay. I, so what I see happening is that um, reconciliation advancing and puzzling itself out and then hopefully what we'll see is AI being used in an assistive way for a lot of things we already have. Um, and I do hope also that the whole notion of working with AI, whether it be generative AI and bringing those models into applications and um, straight up analytics or um, going with uh, more conventional machine learning, but making that much more accessible, much easier. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I think that's a necessary next step. Another possibility, and some companies are already doing this, is to use AI to do things like populate data catalogs, okay. um, do data governance and, and, and generate policy. Hopefully not generate it, you know, in bulk and that and it's one and done hopefully generate it as a starting point yeah. for data stewards and so forth to look at it and then um and correct it in certain cases and sure. and and augment it um and uh and, and that's what that's how i sell the co-pilot uh, suite of tools it's deliberately named co-pilot right because right you're still the pilot um and what we're starting to see is um you know, ETL pipelines, data, yeah, data movement pipelines, 
becoming kind of auto healing if the underlying schema of the source or the destination changes, mm -hmm. or if there's some glitch in um, carrying out the pipeline at whenever it's scheduled to run, to be able to use AI to kind of fix itself and adapt. Hmm. That's still kind of science fiction-y, but it's starting to happen. So the problem with big data is that it's big, which makes it harder to govern and harder to integrate and just because there's more of it, right? right? And hope, the hope of AI is that it can then make that more um, approachable again. Awesome. Uh, are you doing more speaking? You have something come up? Um, the panel that I mentioned. Oh, that's today. But, yeah. I mean, uh, this won't be published for <laughs> probably ah, a few I weeks. See. <laughs> it's, uh, anything coming up in the future, like next month or? Mm -hmm. I, my next uh, my next speaking gig will be at Visual Studio Live in Orlando, or really Live 360 in Orlando, okay. in November. I co-chair three different co-located events there. We have Visual Studio Live, we have Data Platform Live, and we have Artificial Intelligence Live. Oh, I didn't hear about Artificial Intelligence Live. We added that uh, to our credit, I think, You're about the board of the SLAC. Four, four or five years ago. Um, I'm a, I'm a co-chair of those three events, yeah. And I've been speaking at VS Live since 1995, so, yeah. <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much. Thanks. One thing I've always found about technology is that the vocabulary around different pieces of technology um, is designed to keep new people out and you have you have kind of had to navigate that through friends of yours who may already be practitioners in that technology um, if you can knock down the vocabulary you can usually gain entree um, into a new into a new lobe of technology that you haven't worked with before <laughs>